pictures of Marilyn Monroe, as seen through the lens of photojournalist Eve Arnold. It was totally her own. I have never in all the years that I've photographed, and it's many years, seen anyone with the ability to do that. And she did it superbly. But she played. She was able to assess each photographer, uh, even if it was only an amateur with a box camera. She worked with the same intensity and diligence that she would have if she were working with, with a top professional. And she was very clever. She was, uh, when she sensed a camera, because sometimes I didn't even know there was anybody else there with a the camera, suddenly the breasts would heave up, the uh, back, the buttocks would jut out, and she, there she was. She was the movie star. The smile was brilliant. She was always sort of golden looking. And because she had a down just very fine golden hairs all around on her face. It trapped the light. It was extraordinary. I've never seen it before. And acted as a nimbus so that she looked almost angelic. And it was kind of marvelous to photograph her. And the fun was to watch what she would do because you would set a situation. You would say, shall we do so and so? And she would say, fine, let's go with it. <laughs> Eve Arnold took photographs of Marilyn Monroe in the 50s and early 60s, when still photographs were essential to any ambitious starlet. Marilyn knew exactly what fed the camera and always managed to take control of a photographic session. It was her favorite medium, and she had worked hard at creating an image of herself which she knew the camera would capture. By the time they met, Marilyn had already appeared on the cover of Life magazine. They became friends, and to fulfill a promise to Marilyn, Eve has now published an appreciation of the work they did together, going back to the original contact sheets and color prints. Eve Arnold is one of the world's top photojournalists, and in addition to assignments for newspapers and magazines, she has published collections of her photographs, including The Unretouched Woman, a stunning and compassionate glimpse of the lives and condition of women in many parts of the world. She spent five months in China, and the results were a compelling document of its people and moods. She was an early member of Magnum, the renowned photographic agency, and it was at the beginning of her career that Marilyn asked to meet her. What happened was uh, Marilyn had seen a set of pictures I'd done for Esquire on Marlena Diedrich. And you must remember that in the 50s, this was, I think, 1952, and in those days, um, Practically everything was front lit, retouched, um, very carefully organized. And I didn't know about any of that. And I was a documentary photographer. And I had done this series on Marlena Dietrich, uh, singing the songs that she had made famous during the war, Lily Marlene and Mrs. Otis Regrets and all of those. I simply, took her as she was. There was no posing, no setup, no lighting, no tripod, just me and Marlena singing. And there we were working on this, and we were both at a party for John Houston, <clears throat> given a 21 in New York. And Sam Shaw, the mutual friend, brought her over and introduced us, and she looked at me and she said, if you did that well with Marlena, can you imagine what you can do with me? Which I thought was quite wonderful because she had a naive quality, but she also had a great s sense of showmanship and self-promotion. And she could see herself, I was sure, and what she was going to look like in Esquire. So I said that I would ask my editors and we would talk about it. And I can't remember anymore why it took so long, but it must have taken six months or so. When I had looked for a place in which to photograph her, I had found both a playground and what looked like a dramatic Chinese landscape with uh, bamboo and um, grasses, what looked like elephant grasses, and I figured it could look like anywhere. And then she had put on a leopard skin bathing suit, so she really looked like 
like an animal going through the forest, and I thought that would be marvelous. However, when we got there, to my chagrin, I found that it had rained the night before, and the place was muddy and wet and sludgy and black. And she was wonderful. She lay in it, she stood in it, she romped in it. She was just a delight. And her hands were just covered in mud, and her knees and her legs, and, and when we got through, she was laughing, and I was laughing. And, and this is part of the thing that kept coming back when I decided to do the book. After I did the session in the bulrushes and the um, playground, I went to see her to show her the stuff. Now, I was so inexperienced that I didn't know that unless the arrangement has been made beforehand, you do not go and show your subject what you've done. And I, I imagine it's done for several reasons, in, in case they don't like it or in case they decide that they want to be the editor and whatever. But, you know, you feel that your right as a photographer might have been challenged. At any rate, because I didn't know, and I would have gone anyhow, because I liked her and I wanted her to be happy with me, I went to see her, and we had a rather strange session. She was staying at the Waldorf. She was on suspension from 20th Century Fox, still trying to work out her own company. And when I arrived at her door, she had on a diaphanous black negligee, nothing underneath, a hairbrush in her hand. And she said, if you can wait, until I'm interviewed, there's a lady coming from, I forgot, the magazine, somewhere, middle European magazine. Then we'll look at the pictures afterward. And I said, fine. So I came in, I sat down, and pretty soon there was a knock at the door, and the lady came in, and the lady sat down on a chair, put her bag on a low table, reached over to get the, bag, the pencil and the pad out, and Marilyn, meanwhile, said, do you mind if I brush my hair? No, said the lady, of course not. But when she looked up, Marilyn was brushing her pubic hair. And that was a kind of joke. That was a little over the top. But there was always something that she would have thought of to intrigue and to amuse. That poor lady was so shocked. She took off instantly. She didn't wait. She asked a few questions and then left. And then Marilyn and I looked at everything, and she loved it. One or two things she wanted destroyed, I told her to cut them up, and it was all color. And she did, and I left. And then I didn't hear anymore. Months went by. And then one day, one night, about 4 o'clock in the morning, I guess it was, I got a call from her saying that she was going to Beemont, Illinois, which was about 1,500 miles from New York. And would I join her at 10 o'clock the next morning and go to Beemont with her, I could have an exclusive story because it'd be only she and her hairdresser. And I said, what are you going to be doing? She said, I'm going to bring art to the masses, which seemed like a strange thing. And what she said was that there was going to be an art show in Beemont, and she was going out to open the art show. And she'd gone along, and it was a horrendous day. Because in those days, we flew first to Chicago, then waited two hours for another plane. Then we flew to Champaign, Illinois. Then the governor's escort with a car and some outriders on motorbikes picked us up. And they piped us into Beemont, which was another 80 miles away. And she had forgotten to bring, she had a kidney condition. She'd forgotten to bring her pills, and so her ankles swelled. But she was very game. She was really terrific. And uh, she lay down, and she rested, and she ate grapes. And, and there was a clamor around the place. You couldn't believe people were knocking on the windows in the house where she was. And then, after a couple of hours, a celebration started. She made a speech about our late beloved president. And she was supposed to be talking about Lincoln. It sounded like Eisenhower when she got through as president at the time. She was wonderful. And it was in Chicago when we had that heavy layover, which took hours. Um, and she went into the ladies' room. And you know, as another woman, I just followed after. I didn't intend to shoot. But she looked so wonderful with her skirts hiked up and those little fat, chubby legs, which nobody thought of as being that way, hanging out below. Because I always thought of her as kind of slender. And what she had, which was wonderful, was a capacity 
to think tall because she was small. And so you would look at her, and some days it would just break your heart because she looked a little dumpy. And then you would photograph her, and she would photograph 10 pounds lighter, which is against every rule in the book. She would be able to bring herself up and sort of stretch so you had a sense of length, which wasn't there. Um, it was all so different from what you would expect. You know, you would see it, and you could see the transformation before your eyes while you were filming, and that was kind of marvelous. You see, she had built a character, uh, and she felt secure with the character. So she stayed with it. And somewhere along the line, it seems to me that as long as she believed that she was Marilyn Monroe and a movie star, and she wasn't yet, that was fine. She could cope with that. She could deal with it. She loved it. When the fantasy became the reality, it was no longer tenable for her. She found that she, uh, she then was fragmented. She, everybody wanted something from her. But it was always the public to whom she played. Uh, she would put on a performance that would be extraordinary no matter where she went. And that was, that was heart and soul to her. That was, that was identity. That was the person that she was and the person she wanted to be. I photographed her over a 10 year stretch. There were six photographic sessions, in addition to which we saw each other uh, socially. But in the beginning, uh, there was something like the shortest of the six sessions was two hours, and the longest was two months on the film The Misfits that John Houston directed. Arthur Miller had written the short story which was intended to tell a tale about three men who were adventurers, worked on the desert, and brought in the wild horses, which they then sold, they rope lassoed, and took them prisoners, so to speak, and then sent them off to be killed for dog food. And into this wildlife of theirs came Marilyn. But in the short story, I don't think Marilyn was part of that. When Arthur met Marilyn, he then rewrote the story. It then became the basis for the film called The Misfits. It had Clark Gable in the lead. It had Marilyn as the female lead. It had Montgomery Clift, Eli Wallach. But it was meant to be exquisitely made. It was meant to be a small statement, but very serious. And it was meant to bring Marilyn forward as a very serious actress. And this was Miller's Valentine to Marilyn. The marriage was already over, but what he had wanted to do with it was to give her a gift, and he did, I think. She adored all of it. She loved the attention. She loved these very handsome men. What she didn't like was the fact that they were all such polished actors. When they kept changing lines, they would just read them off and be word perfect. And she would have difficulty because she, A, she didn't have the training, and B, she was, she was troubled, and it was difficult to remember the lines when she was going through a trying time. But she did like them, and then there was always the business of their touching her, or she would be touching them. And when you think back over it, it seems like a cry for help. Actually, what it was, I think, is, is just a need for human physical contact. And there's one pyramid where I have Clift and Ralph Roberts. And Roberts is rubbing Marilyn's shoulders, Clift is rubbing Robert's shoulders, and so on, up the line. The idea was that 
the uh, film company did not want Marilyn to be troubled by hundreds of photographers because they would have been over that four, four or five month stretch they made the film. So in order to make her life easier, it was agreed that Magnum would come out two by two, like in the arc, two people every two weeks. And we would photograph and in that way prevent all this madness that would go on and, you know, kind of repetitive thing of taking the same pictures by many photographers. So in the end, but in the end, she got very tired of the whole thing and she asked, I went out for two weeks and she asked if I could stay on and I stayed for eight weeks with her and we photographed. And in the end, there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of sheets of contact uh, material and it was hopeless because during the time of the filming, she was supposed to make sure that everything was checked out and edited and what she didn't want was refused and what she did want was used. It was all set up. And in the end, it got hopeless because the making of the film was fraught with problems. She was ill at the time. She was disturbed. She had twice taken uh, an overdose of sleeping tablets, I'm sure by accident, because her big enemy was that she couldn't sleep. And so nights she would take two pills and then two more pills and then forgetting she'd wake up and wouldn't remember she'd be muzzy and in the morning she could hardly find her way around so it was so tough for her that I guess it was simpler for her just to have me and there was Ernst Haas who was mad about the wild horses in the film so he was with the horses I was with the actors most of the time when we were checking out the contact sheets and picking the pictures that would be used uh, we would sit daily in her flat on 57th Street. It went on for a week. Each of us with a set of contact sheets and a grease pencil and a jeweler's loop, looking at endless pictures of Gable. He had died the week before, and she was devastated by this. And she would always give me these instructions for retouching. And one day I said to her, Marilyn, what is this about Clark? And she said, you know, when I was in the orphanage, I was a little girl. She said, he came in my fantasies and brought coloring books and crayons, not just for me, but for all the other little girls. So can you imagine what it meant to me? Because in my fantasies, he was my father, and then suddenly there he was on screen with me. She was very touched by the whole thing, and she adored him. And there's one picture somewhere in here where you see the back of Gable and the front of Marilyn, and there's a rubber tire somewhere. And she looks very happy, and she's hugging him. And that was the moment when he told her he was going to be a father. I knew about it because he told me the day before. And she was so thrilled because there he was, 63, expecting his first child. And as you know, she'd had some bad luck herself, so she was just delighted with that. She was really quite wonderful with me because she promised, except for one session that I set up uh, on the desert late at night, there's one with, where she's holding her pigtails. Everything else had to be done in a studio. It's a kind of shooting I don't particularly like and it's not something that I think I'm comfortable with, but it's what she wanted because she could then do her sex bit. Marilyn knew her picture was going to be on the cover of the world's magazines to publicize the misfits. So in addition to the documentary material which had already been shot, Eve set up a special studio session after the film had been completed. I asked her what she wanted to look like and she said like the Botticelli Venus. And I laughed and I said, you probably mean a Rubens. And she didn't know what I meant, so I let it go. They are artificial, they're lit. There's a background of a, what looks like a blue sky with clouds. It's actually, I ordered it specially. She was one of the people who created camp. And I figured, let's camp it up if we're going to do it in the studio. Then let's phony it up, like let's make it fun, let's let her give her head, let her do what she wants, because I already had her on film, I felt, as I saw her. So why not? And if that's what she wanted, that's what she was going to have. And this was, she was 
really going back into the time when she'd been happiest, which is in the early 50s, doing these cheesecake photographs. And when she arrived, her eyes were like saucers. She was only an hour late, which was rare. And she said, this is at the end of the day, she said it again, but at the beginning she said it looked wonderful. And then at the end of the day, she turned to Whitey and she said, we've never had it so good. But early in the day, when he started to make her up, she said, why do you remember when we started? She said, look at all of this, but in those days we had hope, which was crushing for me to hear this. Uh, it told a great deal about the inner turmoil of the woman, and it was painful to hear. After she died, there was a set of pictures that Bert Stern had taken of her, and they were wild and almost out of control when he shot them. I don't know whether she was uh, hyped up from sheer excitation or whether she'd been drinking or what had happened to her, but she was absolutely wild during that session. And they were semi-nudes, uh, nudes with uh, scarves, diaphanous scarves that she was playing with. And she hated most of a great many of those pictures. And she had agreed that she, she would go through them and that they would have to go along to her choices. And in the end, what happened was that uh, Bert Stern sent her only about a third of the pictures. And what she returned to them were, had been gouged with some kind of a sharp instrument, a hairpin or something like that. And she hated them. And in the end, he used them in his book. And I, I feel that that kind of invasion, if somebody lends you their face, I think you owe them the courtesy of trying to make them, you know, you don't have to flatter them, you don't have to retouch them, you don't have to do any of that. But I do think you owe them the courtesy of having them look as well as they could. And I suppose for me, and maybe one of the reasons that I finally decided to do this book was the ultimate in, in horror for me of what can happen to a picture. The, uh, in the Summers book, he uses the picture taken of her in the morgue, and that hurt, because all of us who worked with her and respected her and loved her, cared about her, wanted her to come off as, 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 as nice, as intelligent, as wonderful as she was, and it hurt when that was used. Is that one of the reasons why you decided to publish the book now? Yes, I think it was one of the reasons. There, but also, during the past few years, I didn't want to exploit the material. I, some of the material, about 20% of what's in the book, was used, and that was already in the files of the Magnum agents in their own offices in Paris and New York. And, but everything else, I embargoed when she died and put it away. And I really didn't want to, first of all, I didn't want to do it because I didn't want to believe that she was dead. So, and it was painful. And it was interesting that when I finally did decide to do the book, it was not painful because I found all the material, of uh, the contemporary material, the contact sheets, my own notes of each session. In reading it, I started to remember the joy in the early sessions and the fun, and it became a kind of loving reminiscence of her. It could be said that you're exploiting her memory as well. Yes, I guess it could be said. Um, except that my reason um, was selfish. I wanted to figure out who she was and what she was. It was that. Uh, it was also the business of wanting to put a few facts straight. Not that I think that it'll have any influence when they're 604 books who say differently, and one person makes a mistake and the other 603 pick it up. No, I think you can say that I'm exploiting it. I hope not vulgarly and not nastily. Yes, I think we all used her. I don't think there's any question about that. I think as a photographer, uh, one has to accept the fact that one does invade other people's privacy. And however, you could argue that without the still camera, Marilyn would not have been Marilyn. We would not have seen her, because that's the way most people saw her. 
unless they saw her films. And they wouldn't have gone to see the films if the publicists hadn't built in this character. So it's a circular thing. I don't quite know how to, how to explain it beyond the fact that we all used each other. She used me to help her to get where she was going, me and hundreds of others. You know, I was not unique in that. Unique only in the fact that she trusted me. You see, the thing that was, was interesting is that she would be late, she would be difficult. She was with that press conference with Laurence Olivier, uh, when she kept him and Terence Radigan sitting out in a little sofa, pictures of these two men sitting with, gritting their teeth in an ante room at the Waldorf while she was getting ready. And she had asked me to come up and see her before she started. And she was already an hour late. Um, I didn't want to come, and then she sent the publicist, and I came up, and she said, uh, watch me in the mirror. I said, you look great. And at 11 o'clock in the morning, she had on this black velvet gown with tiny sort of spaghetti straps and a velvet coat and a sort of lovely uh, sheer scarf around her neck and blonde against this black and the white skin. And finally she came down and they posed on a balcony at the Wilder and then they walked down and she was caught in this great crowd and then they sat down at a table. And Olivier uh, picked up the microphone, this big hand mic, and he started talking into it and answering questions for making the announcement that they were going to be doing The Prince and the Showgirl in England. And the next thing was that uh, he would answer questions. It was all very serious and pontificating. And then suddenly, Marilyn leaned back, pushed her coat back, leaned forward, and broke one of the straps, and the whole place went mad. And safety pins were handed, and laughter was heard, and she had the microphone. It was her show. But that was, I'm sure, was premeditated, after which she was very angry when people asked her if she'd planned it. I think she did. The last time that I photographed Marilyn, she had called from the hospital early on when I had met her when we'd gone to Bement, Illinois. She had had an illness, a kidney ailment, which doctors describe as an ailment of women who are fair, fat, flatulent, and 40. And she was precocious because she was 28 when she got it. And then in her 30s, she was operated on. And she called me from the hospital and said that there was a woman's magazine, I think it was called Good Housekeeping, that wanted to do a story on Mrs. John Kennedy's hairdresser, it was called Kenneth, and the article was called Mrs. Kennedy's Kenneth. But since he was also Marilyn's hairdresser, would I come and photograph Marilyn? And she looked wonderful. She'd just gotten out of the hospital. She'd slimmed down. Kenneth had done a kind of wonderful sweeping hairdo for her. And it was just laughter and pleasant. And uh, I photographed her. And that was the last time. And I only used about a half a roll of film because it was all there. There was no point in going on. And she was tired and just come from the hospital. That was the last time I photographed her. But there was a time when she called after that. I was living in London at the time. And I'd just gone back to New York. And I was at home in the country. And she called, and she said she was going to sing happy birthday to the president. John Kennedy was then president. And I had just come in. I was exhausted. And I knew what it would be. It would be me dancing attendance and coming in first, and she would come in with lots of other people. And I was tired, and I thought there was nothing I could add to everything I'd done. And I said, Marilyn, I think not. And I've always regretted it, because I think it might have been nice to have seen her that once, when she sang in that breathy voice of hers. But that was it.
to buy arms. 